The chill morning air hung heavy over the rugged peaks and valleys of Glacier National Park on the day that this all went down. For Sam, a veteran park ranger, it should have been just another routine Wednesday patrol. But that was all about to change. Sam had hiked the Highline Trail hundreds of times before in his 12 years serving at the park and was intimately familiar with every twist and turn of the path. He knew the wild inhabitants, from the grizzlies and elk, down to the little pikas that scampered between rocks. But for us to hear what happened, in his own words, makes this story even more terrifying. Here's what Sam wrote in to us. I've worked as a park ranger here at Glacier National Park for the last 12 years. It's an amazing place, with scenery and wildlife like nowhere else on Earth. The things I've seen out here you wouldn't believe, and we're not really supposed to share the scary stuff with visitors anyway, but I can't keep it in any longer. It all went down on the morning of July 24th. I remember the date clear as day because of how strange and frankly terrifying the whole thing was. It had been a routine start to my Wednesday. I clocked in at around 6 a.m. to grab my gear and truck. The forecast was calling for great weather, so I planned to spend most of the day patrolling some of the higher elevation trails. After getting my pack and supplies loaded up, I headed out towards the Highline Trail around 8 a.m. It's one of the most popular routes in the park because of the amazing views, switchbacks and some steep inclines, but a pretty straightforward out and back trail that I'd hiked hundreds of times before. No big deal. The first few hours were totally normal ran into a couple day hiker groups making their way to the lookout point at Haystack Butte, but nothing out of the ordinary. I stopped to chat and make sure they had enough water and supplies. Around 10 a.m. I looped around past the butte to take in the vista from another angle. That's when things started to get weird. As I came around a bend in the trail, I noticed a huge pile of animal droppings smack dab in the middle of the path. We're talking massive here easily 14 or 15 inches across and 8 inches high. Easily bigger than anything I'd seen from a bear. The droppings looked sort of oblong and fibrous, like they contained grass and plants rather than bones or meat. Now, obviously my first thought was bear, since they're so prevalent around here. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized this didn't look quite right for bear scat. It was all compacted and layered in a weird way, almost I don't know how to describe it, but it looked unnaturally piled up there instead of just scattered, if that makes any sense. Regardless, I pulled out my ranger notebook and ducked down to take some notes and measurements. That's when I heard the first loud footsteps up above me on the hill. It sounded heavy, like something big shifting its weight as it walked. I froze and strained my ears to try and pick up which direction it was coming from. That's when I heard a powerful snuffling noise, like some massive animal sniffing or snorting in the air. It sounded so loud and so close. I looked up towards the hill, but I didn't see anything through the trees. My heart was pounding at this point. I'm not gonna lie. I pivoted and slowly turned to try to pinpoint where the sounds were coming from. That's when I saw it peeking out through the tree line about 75 yards uphill. This massive hairy beast is the only way I can describe it. It was hunched over but still looked easily eight feet tall, thick muscular legs and powerful shoulders. Its entire body was covered in matted brownish red fur, but it had this weird, almost conical shaped head that seemed too small compared to the rest of its bulk. I'll never in a hundred years forget the way it just stopped when it saw me and cocked its head from side to side, almost like a disturbing animated version of that famous Bigfoot sketch. Its movement seemed so simultaneous human-like, but not quite right, you know? Like it was mocking the mannerisms of a person. We just stood there, frozen, taking each other in for what felt like an eternity, but was probably no more than 30 seconds. That's when it opened its gigantic mouth, and I saw rows of thick, jagged fangs that seemed far too large for any normal animal. Its jaws parted, and I could see the ridiculously long, snake-like tongue lolling out. That's when it let out this guttural, wheezing howl that chilled me to the bone. I knew in that moment whatever this thing was. It wasn't a bear or a Bigfoot or any other wildlife I could rationalize. This was something else. 
something that shouldn't exist. Despite every natural instinct screaming at me to run, I stayed rooted in place. Maybe it was the sheer shock and amazement, or the terrifying realization that if this creature wanted to charge, there's no way I could outrun it. So I simply stood there, not taking my eyes off it. That's when it started, sniffing the air again and tilting its massive head. Then, impossibly, it seemed to look right at me, its small sunken eyes locking with mine in an eerie moment of intelligence. There was real awareness and thought behind that gaze, like the eyes of a human peer. We stayed that way, simply regarding each other for what felt like forever, but was likely only 30 to 45 seconds. The sounds of the forest seemed to go silent, everything holding its breath in that suspended instance. Finally, almost dismissively, the creature simply turned its bulky body and started lumbering further up the hillside away from me, disappearing back into the tree line. I stayed frozen a good two or three minutes after that, trying to process whatever the hell I had just witnessed. My head was spinning, breath heavy. I had to resist the urge to vomit from the sheer weirdness and adrenaline dump. It took me a while to get reoriented and to be able to head back down the trail the way I had come. All I could think about was getting out of those hills and back to the main visitor center near the park entrance. I radioed into the station on my walkout but kept getting patchy service. The few bits that did come through though made it clear they didn't have any idea what I was talking about when I described what I saw. I could tell the dispatcher thought I was either pranking them or had maybe been out in the sun too long. When I finally made it back a few hours later, I gave the full incident report to the lead ranger on duty. His face went slightly pale as I walked through all the specific grotesque details. Said he'd never heard of anything like that in his 20 years at the park. We pulled in the wildlife biologist to take a look at the scat I found, but they seemed just as perplexed as the rest of us. Ultimately, the biologist took samples and made casts of the footprint impressions I was able to find nearby. But so far, they haven't been able to determine exactly what that thing was. All they can confirm is that it wasn't any known species of bear or other animal in the area. And that's pretty creepy if you think about it, which is exactly what I'm trying to do. When was the last time you found yourself face to face with the unknown? With something that you couldn't quite explain, even if you really wanted to. Sometimes people can't help but go searching for moments like that. But what they do in those moments is what makes their story unique. Henry found himself in one of those encounters not long ago. While he'd never been a fan of the ocean or the lakefront, on one unfortunate summer evening, he found himself in the recesses of a local swamp near his house in Louisiana. He was chasing a rumor that locals only whispered about, the legend of the frogman. Or maybe he was chasing the proof he needed to extinguish that story once and for all. Henry just wanted to accomplish something significant. His slow, idle summer had turned into a strange sort of motivation. At least he could say he went on this adventure. As he stood in the swamp, his feet were wet, and his forehead was scratched, and the sweat on his back was sticking his shirt to his shoulders. He fidgeted and complained silently to himself, only continuing forward because the thought of turning back was just as unpleasant as moving forward. Maybe he'd find a cool spot, Maybe he'd find a place to sit down. The air was thick with humidity, each step sinking into the slippery muck beneath. An eerie song of croaks and chirps surrounded him. The swamp had its very own sounds, and this was Henry's first time ever hearing it. It was far from his favorite type of music. The insects and the toads were almost aggravating, probably because of how uncomfortable he was. He wondered how they could they be so comfortable in a place like this. Henry's irritation clung to him like the oppressive moisture in the air, but somehow his curiosity pushed him forward. As the daylight faded, the area cast elongated shadows. Branches looked like they had turned into snakes and worms. Logs turned into alligators, waiting to spring to life and snap their jaws at Henry's heels. His steps became wary, clumsy even. It made the journey even less pleasant somehow, the rustling leaves and occasional splash fueled his imagination. The feeling of being watched settled upon him. He assumed he was overthinking, 
Paranoia was even less comfortable than the heat. Then a soft, throaty croak echoed in the distance. It wasn't a regular frog's call. It sounded almost human, like a man whose lungs were full of water, like the most content drowning in the history of the world. That thought was enough to send shivers down Henry's spine. Whatever made the sound, he wanted to see it. A ripple soon disturbed the stagnant water, and a figure emerged from the shadows, covered in a slick, greenish hide. Pond scum sloughed off the shape like burned skin. It wasn't a creature of folklore or fairy tales that Henry found in the swamp. The frogman was real, and Henry stood frozen in disbelief. He'd been searching for an answer, for something to make his summer memorable, but now that he had it, what could he do but stand in terror? It was amazing, sure, but it was entirely inhuman. Bulbous eyes, gleaming like polished emeralds fixed upon him. The creature's webbed hands clutched at the marshy ground as it approached, its movements unnervingly graceful. How could it move so effortlessly in a place that felt like quicksand? Henry's breath quickened. He fumbled for his phone, his trembling fingers struggling to capture evidence of the surreal encounter. The creature's eyes locked onto the device and a guttural croak escaped its throat. Henry took it to be a warning, or maybe a question. He wondered if the creature mistook the phone for a weapon. It didn't matter. He couldn't risk using it and putting himself further into harm's way. The phone returned to his pocket. The frogman's humanoid face shared a glimpse of unspoken wisdom, gratitude. Those eyes looked knowledgeable. They even looked fearful in their own way. The longer Henry stared, the more the creature's mouth appeared to be frowning. Was it unhappy too? The air between them was charged with an otherworldly energy, and Henry's skepticism wavered in the face of the frogman. Reality was sinking in, however unbelievable, just like his boots were sinking into the mud. A low rumble then reverberated from the creature's chest. It wasn't a word, but Henry, startled, jumped, and took its meaning right away. It was a grunt of approval. The monster gestured towards the murky waters, inviting Henry to follow. Despite the fear gnawing at him, an urge that he couldn't quite explain compelled him onwards. It was like he was convinced with just one more step, maybe everything would suddenly make sense. So he trekked in the wake of the frogman's steps. He followed the strange amphibian further and further into the water. When the frogman eventually descended into the murky depths, Burying its head beneath the surface, Henry was left standing waist deep in the swamp. He was left staring at the ripples the creature left behind, unable to continue but unwilling to leave. He wanted to follow it, but why? He knew going further would certainly be disastrous, if not impossible, and yet, something wanted him to duck his head beneath the surface. After standing there for a while, only staring, clarity set in. Henry turned back. He was solemn. He was defeated despite the nature of his encounter. The walk back was even less pleasant than his journey into the swamp. Now his socks were soaking wet. His pants were stained by the dark water. And now, worst of all, he knew for a fact that living, monstrous things were lurking all around him. The snakes and the alligators didn't feel so unlikely all of a sudden. They'd be the most realistic thing he'd seen all day. Henry had found the very summer he was hoping for. And after he finally returned home, he regretted searching for it at all. A boring few months aren't the end of the world, he thought. But now he had learned his lesson. I'm an experienced backpacker who has hiked all over the Pacific Northwest over the past decade. I've encountered a lot out there. You name it, I've seen it out in the wilderness. But I'm here to tell you about a bizarre and unsettling experience I had last month, deep in the mountain ranges of northern British Columbia. It was a five-day solo trip I had been planning for months. The Stikine area is one of the most remote and rugged parcels of mountains in all of Canada. Limited marked trails, jagged peaks, fields of rock and scree. It's the type of untamed landscape I crave to get that sense of true solitude while backpacking. On the third day, I had knocked out about 15 grueling miles and made camp for the night near a small alpine lake nestled between two towering cirques of rock. I pitched my tent in a flat spot a couple hundred feet from the water's edge. 
With camp set, I cooked up a dehydrated chili meal and watched the alpen glow fade from the surrounding peaks as night fell. That's when I first noticed something odd occurring in the lake. There was a disturbance out in the shallows, almost like a large rock or fallen tree trunk being pulled along just below the surface, causing a peculiar splashing and roiling of the water. Now anytime you notice something unusual in the wilderness, your animal brain kicks into high alert, looking for potential danger. I grabbed my binoculars and focused in on the area of disturbance across the lake, initially thinking it could be a bear swimming and foraging for fish. But then this long, serpentine form started breaching the surface of the water, undulating and contorting in erratic motions, unlike anything I'd seen an animal do before. As it rose higher, I realized I was looking at some kind of elongated neck and body, at least 15 to 20 feet long from my vantage point. My logical mind was having trouble computing what I was witnessing. It didn't make any sense for a creature like an eel or anaconda to be in this tiny, freezing alpine lake thousands of miles from warm ocean waters. Yet there it was plainly in front of me, surfacing and diving back into the depths repeatedly in almost dolphin-like arcs and twists. Then it happened. The creature raised its head up, and I could clearly make out reptilian features reminiscent of dinosaurs or prehistoric animals I'd only seen in books and museums. It had a long, horse-like face with bony ridges along the jawline and enlarged nostrils at the end of a tapered snout. I felt my heart started pounding at the realization that I was observing what could only be described as a living dinosaur or relic species long thought to be extinct. The monster seemed to be hunting or feeding plunging its jaws into the water to snap at fish or other prey. I had to document what I was witnessing, so I began recording video on my phone while continuing to surveil the creature through my binoculars. After a few minutes, its head suddenly whipped in my direction on the shoreline. Our eyes met for a split second before the beast opened its jaws and let out a deafening, bone-chilling roar that echoed across the whole mountain valley. I've heard black bears bellow up close before, and even that wouldn't compare to the deep, thunderous, guttural bellow unleashed by this leviathan. It was like a foghorn mixed with a lion's roar, shaking my internal organs with its primordial intensity. In that moment, pure animal fear gripped me tighter than anything I'd ever experienced in the wilderness before. I immediately retreated to the safety of my tent, zipping up the rainfly over the entrance and laying in silence, my heart still pounding out of my chest. Every few minutes, I could hear the creature roar again from the direction of the lake, almost as if it was searching for me, enraged that a human had spotted its existence. I've never felt so vulnerable and defenseless. Here I was, deep in the backcountry, cut off from the outside world, laying in a thin nylon shelter while some hellish prehistoric beast patrolled the woods nearby. All my logic told me I should pack up and get moving to put distance between us but I was paralyzed by fear of making any sound that could give away my location. So I laid there in tense silence, tracking every footstep, splash, or bellow until sheer mental exhaustion finally took over sometime late in the night. When I awoke at first light, my primal instincts kicked back in and I immediately broke down camp, packed up, and got moving along the trail without cooking breakfast or making any noise that could attract the creature. I must have hiked 10 miles out before I finally felt safe enough to slow down. For the rest of the trip, I kept constantly scanning the landscape around me, jumping at every little sound or bird taking flight from the brush. But I never saw or heard any other signs of the monster after that harrowing night at the lake. In the weeks since returning home, I've analyzed and rewatched the video I captured over and over, straining to find rational explanations. But part of me knows what I saw and heard was real. Some unidentified species that by all accounts simply shouldn't exist in this modern age. I've shared my encounter with wildlife authorities and numerous cryptozoology researchers. But so far, there's been no definitive explanation of what exactly I came face to face with in those remote Canadian ranges. All I know is something out there coexists with humans on this planet some ancient remnant species that time forgot. And I'm one of the only people who can recount witnessing it firsthand. For now, 
The only thing I want to do is steer clear of that region altogether. A part of me is deeply curious to know more, to have this mystery solved by science once and for all. But another part of me doesn't dare risk crossing paths with that bone-chilling leviathan again. At least not without an array of tranquilizer guns and paleobiologists in tow. So that's my story. Part of me still struggles to believe it myself some days. But the reality is, I can never unsee what happened on the shores of that mountain lake, burned into my psyche forever. Out there in the uncharted wilderness, I can tell you that for certain, the prehistoric still exists in the present day. We just don't know it until we come face to face with it ourselves. I'm in construction management, and I have been for two decades. About two months ago, my crew and I were hired to build a new bridge spanning across a remote canyon out in the New Mexico desert, near the borders of Texas and Mexico. It was going to be one of those big suspension bridge projects that takes a couple of years to finish. We got to the isolated job site during the first week of April to start the initial surveying and prep work before construction could begin. The canyon was pretty deep, probably around 500 feet down, and curved away into the rocky desert landscape. Our job that first week was to map out the exact location where the massive concrete bridge foundations would go on each side of the canyon. There were six of us in the surveying crew. Me, Jose, Billy, Trent, Caleb, and another supervisor, Ron. On our third day there, we were out working on the west ridge of the canyon, taking measurements and marking the area with bright orange spray paint and small flags to note where everything needed to go. It was getting late in the day, probably around 6.30 p.m. or so, as the sun was starting to get lower in the sky. Jose and I were standing on the ridge looking out across the canyon, when movement down in the shadows caught my eye. At first, I just figured it was a deer, coyote, or maybe even a bear making its way across the canyon floor, which was probably 200 to 300 yards away from where we were. But as I focused in, I could see whatever this thing was. It was massive, definitely bigger than any animal I've seen around here. I nudged Jose and was like, Hey man, you see that thing down there? What the hell is that? He pulled out his binoculars and was just as confused as I was. This creature seemed to be hunched over and lumbering along slowly but upright on two legs like a human. From what we could make out, it looked at least eight or nine feet tall, maybe bigger, and was covered in this shaggy matted fur all over its body. Jose and I called over to the others. Hey guys, you need to see this thing down here. The rest of the crew made their way over and we all just stood there in stunned silence, watching this massive bizarre creature moving about down in the canyon. The most unsettling part was its head. It had this elongated face that didn't look human at all, more like a horse or something, but with these massive teeth, almost like tusks, protruding out of its mouth, and the awfully hunched gorilla-like posture just made it look even more unnatural. We all had our binoculars and eyes locked on it, trying to make sense of whatever the hell this thing could possibly be. That's when it ripped up one of the scraggly desert bushes growing on the canyon floor and started shoving chunks of it into its mouth with these huge, powerful arms. A couple guys wondered if it could somehow be some sort of bear that had gotten mutated or something from the radiation out here. But none of us had ever seen anything remotely like this crazy creature before in our lives. We kept watching it foraging along the rocks and bushes, eating God knows what, for probably five or six more minutes before it suddenly stopped in its tracks. And that's when it seemed to notice us all standing up on that west ridge, staring at it through our binoculars and whatnot. This beast suddenly turned and looked right at us, and let out this ear-piercingly loud screaming roar that shook me to my core. I felt like I'd gone deaf for a good 30 seconds after that incredibly powerful, shrill screech. Holy crap, did you guys hear that? Ron yelled over the still echoing cries bouncing around the canyon walls. We were all just frozen too terrified and confused to even move or say anything else at first. This creature kept screaming at us, pacing back and forth slightly, almost like it was pissed that we were watching it or something. After what felt like an eternity, 
The screaming finally started to die down into some lower guttural groans and growls. That's when the hulking beast turned away from us and slowly started making its way back into the deeper shadows of the canyon, eventually disappearing behind one of the rock faces. We all just remained still and silent for another couple of minutes, listening to the last few gravelly growls fading into the distance before everything went dead quiet again. That's when Ron yelled for us to get the hell out of there and get back to the trailers as fast as possible. None of us needed to be told twice. We booked it out of there, hauling ass back towards the collection of equipment trailers and trucks that made up our temporary base camp. I don't think any of us said a single word to each other that entire half-mile hustle back. We were all just frantically looking over our shoulders, terrified that grotesque beast was going to come charging after us. When we finally made it back to the trailers, we were out of breath, drenched in sweat, and probably looked like we had seen a ghost. Ron immediately went to find our top construction manager, a no-nonsense old cowboy named Hank, who had been doing this kind of remote job for three decades out in these deserts. Hank, you're not going to believe this, but we just saw... I don't even know what the hell it was, Ron stammered, trying to catch his breath. Some kind of massive creature down in the canyon. Had to be at least eight or nine feet tall, covered in fur, with a horrible screaming roar that seemed to shake the whole damn canyon. Hank just squinted his eyes and looked at Ron like he had three heads. The rest of us started murmuring in agreement, adding little details about the weird, elongated, horse-like face and the powerful gorilla arms. I've never seen Hank look so perplexed in all the years I've known the cranky old fart. You boys are telling me you saw... Hank paused, struggling to find the words. Some kind of big, monstrous creature out there? We all shook our heads adamantly in unison. There was no way any of us were going to be able to properly explain or describe this unnatural, unsettling thing we had just witnessed. Whatever it was, it didn't seem to be anything known to science. Hank let out a big sigh and scratched his head. All right, well, we can't be having any more funny business out there at night until we get to the bottom of what in the world y'all say you saw. We're going to have to pack it up for today and secure the site before sundown. First thing tomorrow morning, I'll call in the wildlife rangers to come sweep the area, see if they can make sense of this. As we gathered our gear and supplies, I couldn't help but look back over at that ominous canyon now bathed in shadows as night fell. I kept replaying the image of that monstrous roaring beast over and over in my head. What the hell was it? Where did it come from? How could something like that exist out here in the middle of the desert without anyone knowing? I had a sinking feeling that whatever ominous secrets lurked in the depths of that rocky canyon were about to be dragged out into the light, whether we were ready for it or not. I just hoped the rangers would be able to provide some kind of logical explanation in the morning, and that we wouldn't be encountering that terrifying creature again anytime soon. The next morning, a team of rangers and wildlife experts arrived to thoroughly search the canyon for any signs of the bizarre creature we had encountered. Despite their best efforts scouring the area for two full days, they found no evidence whatsoever. No tracks, no fur samples, no bones or dwelling sites. It was as if the towering, fur-covered beast had simply materialized out of thin air before our very eyes and disappeared just as inexplicably. The experts had no rational explanation for what we claimed to have witnessed. Some privately wondered if we had merely experienced a shared hallucination that day. But the six of us knew what we saw was undeniably real. And as construction finally began on that bridge project, we went about our work with uneasy glances toward the secluded canyon shadows. We were all haunted by the nagging sense that something ancient still lurked there, patiently watching our intrusion and deciding how to deal with us. Isn't it strange how the smallest things can be the scariest? It's easier for them to burrow under your skin it's easier for them to be the worm in your ear, whispering and chattering. You can lose sight of something small. You worry and wonder, where did it go? You worry in the night maybe, that the tiny creature will come back. It'll make its nest in your hair or in your pillow. It will hide in your shoe and bite you when you slip it on. There are so many places for a small thing to hide, and no one knows that better than Bobby. 
Bobby bought a ranch. He was excited about it at first. He always talked about moving off the grid. Even though his friends thought he was crazy, he was finally accomplishing that dream. He was setting up solar panels and digging a well for himself. He installed a wood stove and day by day grew more comfortable in his solitude. That was until Bobby realized that he was not alone on the ranch. He wanted company, sure, but he wanted company of his own choosing. He wanted a dog or livestock or a partner to share his home with. He did not want the thing he found underneath the sink. The pipes were knocking. They did that sometimes. So when it started up on one summer afternoon, Bobby thought nothing of it. He didn't grab the weapon he would soon wish he had when he went to open the cupboard. Instead, he rolled his eyes, groaned, and climbed down to his knees to tinker with the pipes. When he opened that cupboard, something ran. Bobby jumped and wailed, embarrassingly loud, and moved out of the way just in time for the thing to scurry by. His mind told him that it must have been a rat, a rodent of some kind at least. And yet as he sat there rubbing his eyes and blinking away his fright, he could not help but remind himself. But the thing was standing upright. It was too small to be any kind of person. It was too small to even be a child. But it had been alive. It had run by him. And it had been standing on two legs. Bobby wasn't sure which was worse. Was his skin crawling because it had gotten so close to him? Because it had been living somewhere in his house? or because he couldn't rationalize exactly what it was. He gritted his teeth and decided that it didn't matter. It didn't matter which of those facts were haunting him the most, because he was going to exterminate the thing. What choice did he have? It had invaded his home. Whatever it was, Bobby would treat it like vermin. He set his traps. He watched and he waited. Bobby hunted for the small thing on two legs, but he could not find it. He looked high and low under the beds and in the closets. He searched the barn outside. He searched the shed. There was no sign of the thing on two legs. In fact, over the course of the next few days, Bobby realized that there was nothing to indicate the small thing existed at all. Maybe he'd been exhausted. Maybe he had been drinking that day. Whatever it was, Bobby convinced himself that he had imagined the creature. He had imagined the thing under his sink. And so, Bobby tried to return to life. He tried to resume building his home, but the creature had other ideas. One night, not long after that, Bobby woke to the thing on two legs standing at the end of his bed. Actually, standing on the end of his bed, standing in the space between his feet, in between the lumps on the blanket where his toes were hiding. It was standing there seething and growling. Its eyes seemed to shimmer red. A wiry mat of hair, like a metal brush sprouted from its head. It was crudely dressed in repurposed rags and tatters. Bobby thought he recognized a missing sock being used as a shirt. When he tried to move, when he tried to struggle, Bobby realized that he was stuck. He had never experienced it before. It was sleep paralysis. But now, it seemed the creature inspired it. It froze Bobby in place. It kept him there and it crept closer. With each of the small thing's encroaching footfalls, Bobby felt his heart sink lower into his stomach. He felt his blood slow, thickened by glacier-like ice. It crept onto his stomach. It crept onto his chest. It looked down at him, smiling a grin filled with pointed nail-like teeth. He could feel its breath on his face, and he could smell the sourness of its tongue. And then Bobby became just strong enough to scream. He screamed as loud as ever, and scared the thing that was coming up on him. The creature ran, scurried away, and disappeared over the corner of the bed. With the small monster out of sight, Bobby finally had the strength it took to move. He jumped up. He resumed his search, determined to squash the thing once and for all. But it was gone again. Even when his hunt resumed the following day, the signs of the tiny creature were completely gone. He had lost it. So, Bobby expedited one of his other plans. Bobby got a dog. He got a big dog. He got a big dog with a loud bark and a strong prey instinct. It was better at that kind of thing than Bobby would ever be. And with that dog on the premises, the creature must have learned its lesson. Because the tiny thing on two legs never came back. And it never woke him in the night again. It must have fled like a mouse from a cat. Or Bobby sometimes feared. 
It had learned to walk lightly enough that its footsteps did not disturb his rest and wake him up. But that was a thought that he pushed out of his mind as hard and as fast as he could. I'm really into cross-country skiing and love getting way out in the wilderness away from people and buildings and all that stuff. Last winter, I decided to go on this big multi-day ski trip up in the Canadian Rockies near Banff National Park. I looked at maps and planned out this route that would take me deep into the back country where nobody really goes. The idea was to get as far away from civilization as possible. I drove up from Montana and started my trip on a Saturday morning in early February. The first two days went totally normal, just me skiing through valleys and forests, making my way further and further into the middle of nowhere. I didn't see any other people or even really any signs that humans had been around lately. On the third day is when the really crazy stuff started happening. I was making pretty good time that morning, skiing through this huge valley area surrounded by massive mountain peaks on both sides. The terrain was relatively flat and easy, with some sparse trees here and there, but mostly wide open meadow spaces. As I was coming up on one of the meadows around noon, I noticed something really strange up ahead on the trail. From a distance, it looked almost like a huge boulder or something. But as I got closer, I realized it was actually moving, barely perceptibly, but definitely inching along. That's when I realized whatever it was, it was alive. My first dumb thought was, maybe it's a moose or bear or something. I stopped maybe 100 yards away and just stared at this thing. It was absolutely massive, easily 15 to 20 feet tall at least. It had this weirdly elongated body that sort of resembled a bear, but it was way too big with these stumpy legs as thick as tree trunks. Its arms were these long appendages that dragged along the ground a bit. The whole body was covered in this shaggy matted fur that seemed to be various shades of brown and gray and black. As it turned its head towards me, I realized I had made a huge mistake by getting that close. This thing's face, I'll never be able to unsee it. It had this elongated snout that came out almost like a mini trunk, with these fangs as long as butcher's knives jutting out everywhere. Its eyes were sunken and beady but they burned with malice unlike anything I've ever witnessed. In that moment, I knew this was no ordinary animal. This was something intelligent, something evil. As we locked eyes, my heart just stopped. I tried to back up or turn around or do something, but I was completely paralyzed by terror. The creature just glared at me, barely moving except for its sides heaving with each breath. Then, without warning, it reared back and let out a roar that I swear cracked the very sky in half. This deafening, ear-shattering bellow shook the valley and sent hot spittle and vapor blasting from its mouth. Watching those huge fangs gnashing was probably the most terrifying sight of my life. That seemed to break whatever trance I was in. I whipped around as fast as I could and just started skiing in the opposite direction. I've never skied so fast or so recklessly in my entire life. After a few seconds, I heard the unmistakable sounds of the creature giving chase. These thunderous footfalls that seemed to be getting closer by the second. Towering pines were getting smashed and knocked aside as this monster plowed through the terrain after me. The terrifying roars and snarls never let up, ripping through the air all around me. I could feel the fear and hatred emanating from this thing as if it was a living force filling the air. I don't know how long I was able to maintain that pace, but it felt like an eternity. Every part of my body was screaming for me to stop, but I knew stopping would mean certain death. Whenever I started to falter, another deafening roar would re-energize me through sheer panic alone. Just when I felt like I was about to collapse, the terrain opened up into a wide, flat meadow area with a small frozen lake on the other side. With no trees for cover, I could see for miles in every direction. And what I saw next made me want to vomit. About half a mile away on my left, I saw more of them. An entire pack, five, maybe even six of these beasts, all sniffing the air and letting out those fear-inducing roars. That's when the first wave of true hopelessness and despair washed over me. I was never going to make it out of this valley alive. 
The first creature burst through the tree line maybe 300 yards behind me, snarling and frothing like a blood-crazed predator catching the scent of its prey. I could feel its hot, rancid breath on my neck as it rapidly bore down. That's when something unexpected happened. Up ahead at the far end of the meadow, the ice on that lake started breaking apart. Giant cracks spidered across the surface, until eventually a massive billow of steam and spray erupted into the air, as if the lake was boiling over. And through sheer adrenaline alone, I put on what was likely the most blistering final sprint of my life. I risked a look back and saw that fur-covered monster had slowed its pace, almost seeming afraid as it approached the meadow's edge. To my surprise, several more of the beasts emerged from the tree line, sniffing the air cautiously. The whole pack of them fanned out, pacing the meadow's perimeter while sending out occasional roars or growls. That's when it happened. The entire frozen lake convulsed upwards, spraying untold gallons of rancid brown fluid across the meadow. That's when the towering creature seemed to turn its dozens of eyes in my direction. What happened next is burned into my memory forever. The featureless fanged mouth distended open in the most unnatural way, unhinging wider than should be possible. And from that came a sound I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. It was like someone took every hair-raising screech of absolute terror from every horror movie ever made and amplified it a thousand times over. The cry of eternal, empty damnation itself. I wish I was embellishing, but I'm not. Clutching my skull, I fell to my knees still clinging to coherence by a dauntingly thin strand. The beasts in the tree line were frenzied, letting out their own panicked howls of fear. Or maybe it was confusion. In that moment, I didn't wait to see what fresh hell would present itself. Somehow finding fresh reservoirs of willpower, I turned and sprinted away as fast as humanly possible. Every fiber of my being burned with the need to escape. After what felt like an eternity, I finally reached the edge of a thick grouping of trees, offering some small bit of safety from whatever that was back at the lake. When I dared turn around to look, the meadow was empty, no sign of anything. That's when the doubts and denial set in. Over the following days of plodding through the frozen wilderness, I drove myself half mad questioning what I had seen, trying to rationally process of night of waking nightmares. Part of me desperately wanted to dismiss it all as an exhaustion-induced hallucination. Even now, after getting back to civilization over a week later, I can't shake the feeling that whatever happened out there in that valley, it opened up a crawl space in the back of my mind that can't be sealed. I have newfound reservations about heading out into the unknown. Well, I've said enough for now, because recounting this experience is making me seriously question my own grip on sanity. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. Are you a dog person? Because there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between dog people and cat people. Dog people enjoy the love of their pet most. Cat people enjoy the independence of their companion. And while these two groups both undoubtedly love their pets, there's a clear distinction between them. Are you a dog person? Johnny was. Johnny was a dog person from the moment his dad brought home the Yorkshire Terrier that would eventually chew through six pairs of his shoes. It took a few years to work its way to chewing up the sixth, but the terrier got there all the same. As an adult, Johnny was eager to recapture that kind of love. He was eager to recapture the kind of individual obsession a dog has with its owner. There's something gratifying about that, Johnny thought. Johnny searched for years for the right dog, but finding it may have been a mistake. Johnny first saw the dog at the edge of his property. He owned a wide stretch of land, just a few acres, on the outskirts of a Midwestern town in Iowa. It was as unremarkable as the horizon, which was only marked by small hills and fields of corn. Still, Johnny had become accustomed to that view. When it was obstructed by the shape of the dog, he spotted it immediately. His eyes snapped to it like a paper clip to a magnet. He couldn't pull them away if he tried. Was it a stray dog? Did it belong to one of his distant neighbors? Was it friendly? Johnny decided to answer those questions himself. He moved toward the dog, 
calling out to it with whoops and whistles. The dog stood its ground for a while, ears upright, and nose pointed in Johnny's direction. The closer he got, the larger Johnny realized this dog truly was. It was a massive breed. It would have taken more than a dozen of his terriers to recreate just one of these great dogs. It was inky and dark in color. It stood out against the blue sky perfectly. Still, Johnny couldn't help but feel that there was something unnatural about that coloration. It was almost too dark. He brushed those suspicions aside with the assumption that the dog had gotten into some sort of tar or dirt. When he eventually began to close in on the beast, just a dozen yards or so away, it turned tail and fled. Johnny tried not to be heartbroken. He tried not to let the dog's disappearance impact him in any meaningful way. It was after all just a stray dog, or a neighbor's dog. It wasn't his dog either way. He shouldn't have assumed so quickly that he and the wild animal could forge a bond similar to him and his old pet. He put the dog from his mind and returned to the routine of his life. He briefly considered going to a nearby shelter, or the nearest shelter he could, but decided against it. He quietly hoped that the dog would return. It was late at night when that dog came knocking at the front door. It stirred Johnny from his sleep and dragged him out from beneath his covers. It was unintelligible at first. He couldn't tell what the rapping was. He only knew that it demanded his attention. As he left his bedroom and eventually arrived at the doorway, he recognized the knocking for what it truly was. Scratching. Short, rapid scratching. He could imagine the long nails on the other side of the door that were dragging abruptly across its base. Hello, he called out. When the knocking stopped, his blood ran cold. Whatever was on the other side had heard him, reacted, but said nothing in return. He risked a glance through the people. There it was, so suddenly. The dog was back. It was tall enough, even on all four legs, that he could see the top of its back, the ridge of its spine, and the points of its ears through the peephole. The rest of the dog was obscured. But as he stayed there, holding his breath, the dog noticed his presence. It backed up a few short paces, wrapping those same nails on the floor of the porch, and reversed until it fell into complete view. It was as if the beast was giving Johnny one chance to glimpse it in its entirety. Johnny realized at once that he was pursuing the wrong animal. His dark eyes blinked back at him. A shiver ran across the animal's fur, like a wave from its shoulders to the base of its tail. Johnny watched the skin ripple. He watched the dark hairs on the beast's back standing up. He watched as it bared its teeth and a thin strand of saliva dripped from its bottom lip to the floor. It shook its head. Johnny swallowed loudly. What was he going to do? Hadn't he wanted this? When the animal turned to retreat from his porch, Johnny was overcome with a strange urge. As the tail of the beast disappeared into the darkness, Johnny reached for the doorknob. He couldn't say why, but he had to. He had to act. He had to chase it. It wasn't that the animal reminded him of his old pet anymore. It was something else. Some part of Johnny's subconscious knew that the sight of this dog was more than a coincidence. He stepped out on the porch and tried to find it, but it was gone. There wasn't even a footprint in the dirt beyond the stairs. He told himself that a dog is just a dog, but then, in the animal's absence, the unfortunate things began. Johnny's land was flooded in the next rainy season. The foundation of his home shifted and became unstable. The shingles on his roof were torn away by a heavy storm, and a tree fell onto the hood of Johnny's car. Under any normal circumstances, it would seem like Johnny was the victim of a string of bad luck. But believing in bad luck, Johnny said, was for cat people, and he was a dog person. Even if the animal he'd seen had truly been some omen, some sign that his luck was about to turn sour, he still preferred it to the alternative. He just doesn't want to see that dog again. I'm a biologist, or at least that's what the university I was with called me. They sent me out to Isle Royale, Michigan to study wolves in the wilderness there. It's not really a big tourist spot, just a bunch of woods and nature. That was fine by me though, since I've always been really into wolves. If you ask me, wolves are kind of hard to figure out. They're alone, but also part of a pack. 
They seem scary, but are also respected animals. You see them show up a lot in stories and tales, like they symbolize the wild, uncontrolled parts of nature that are left. To me, the way wolves live proves how things in nature stay balanced. I respect that a lot, which is why I've spent so much time learning about it and trying to protect it. So I was pumped to get to work just hanging out in the middle of nowhere on Isle Royale. Just me in the outdoors. For me, it felt like an adventure a little kid would dream of. One morning, I headed out early with my tracking gear, a notebook, and a mix of nervous excitement. When the sun went down, I could hear the haunting howls of wolves far away. I liked feeling like I was part of the wild out here. Little did I know, I was about to experience something way weirder than I could imagine. As I was walking around tracking, I started noticing all the usual wolf signs. Their tracks, scat, eating, and mating habits. Pretty normal stuff. One day I was out picking wild blueberries, checking which ones were ripe, when something strange happened. Have you ever stepped inside from a super hot day into an air-conditioned room and felt that shocking cold? That's what it was like, except I was just outside in the middle of the woods with no AC for miles. Suddenly it got incredibly, weirdly cold. So cold I had goosebumps and was shivering hard. It was like the warm afternoon sun just disappeared somewhere. So my scientist brain started thinking, maybe it was just some weird weather thing. Strange for sure but probably no big deal. But then I started catching glimpses of something huge moving just beside me out of the corner of my eye. Every time I tried to look straight at it, it vanished. The really nasty part was this overwhelming smell that came with it. It reeked like death, that sharp smell of rotting meat that's been left out way too long. As someone who tracks wolves, I'm used to some nasty smells of death and decaying stuff but this was way worse than anything I've ever smelled before. I figured when I turned around, I'd see a big old bear or enormous moose that could explain the size and smell. But instead, there was nothing there at all, which made it even weirder and more unsettling. It was completely, eerily silent. No birds, squirrels, anything. Just this strange, silent darkness with the reek of death in the air. For a minute, I doubted what was happening and thought maybe it was just my imagination. But I'm a trained scientist. I'm supposed to observe things precisely no matter how weird or creepy they seem. So I tried to just take it all in calmly. Of course, at the time, I was thinking way too scientifically, and logically, instead of remembering this place, has a history of mysteries and local legends. The smart part of me was saying I should just get out of there. But I really wanted to try to figure out what was going on. As the sun went down, the bad vibe just kept getting stronger, so I decided to pack it in for the day. Later that night by the fire, everything felt normal and calm again, but I kept replaying what happened earlier and started wondering if those creepy Wendigo stories people told could actually be true. What I experienced, the gross dead smell, random coldness, and feeling like something was watching me, kind of matched the descriptions of a Wendigo. And so the more I thought about it, the more it kind of seemed to fit. But then again, I'm supposed to be a scientist. We deal in facts and evidence, not myths and legends from old stories. I spent a restless night tossing and turning in my tent, debating if I should just pack up and head home. Part of me felt silly being so freaked out over something I couldn't really explain. But the other part of me knew there was something undeniably real about that unsettling experience even if it defied logic and reason. When the first light of dawn started filtering through the trees, I still hadn't decided what to do. As I cooked up a simple camp breakfast, I kept one eye on the dense forest surrounding me. Was it just my imagination playing tricks? Or was there really something else out there? Something the native people whispered tales about to warn future generations? I figured I'd do one last day of exploring the area and trying to look for any rational explanation before deciding if I needed to leave early. Packing up my bag with fresh supplies and gear, I thought that I might be getting myself in over my head. Maybe I'd find evidence that would let me prove or disprove this whole thing once and for all. Or maybe I'd stumble into something even my academic training couldn't make sense of. Either way, I tried to mentally prepare myself. 
With a deep breath and a stubborn curiosity overtaking my apprehension, I struck out once more into the dense forest. However, apart from the typical sights and smells of the forest, my return expedition that day revealed nothing out of the ordinary. No sudden chills nor mysterious shapes materializing in my periphery. The quiet chorus of birds and scurrying of squirrels filled the air as usual. While part of me felt a twinge of disappointment, the rational part of me took solace in the lack of any further unsettling abnormalities. Perhaps it had simply been a strange mix of factors playing tricks on my senses the previous afternoon. As the sun began its descent, I made my way back to camp, the eerie uncertainties from the day before slowly leaving my mind. The woods had held their secrets once more, leaving me to merely document the known rather than untangling any deep mysteries on this visit to the island wilderness. Nobody likes spiders. There's a good reason for it. There's something innately unnatural about them. Too many legs. Too many eyes. Too many teeth that aren't quite teeth. When you tell someone that you don't like spiders, it's a completely reasonable thing to say. It's just understood that some things make your skin crawl. That's all true, even for the little spiders. But Jenny, she saw a big one. She was 16 at the time. 16 is a good age, isn't it? Old enough to feel like you're finally free to make your own choices, but not so old that responsibility is set in. The whole world lies in waiting. On this particular night, Jenny found that other things were lying in wait as well. Her story is not a gentle one. Truth or dare was popular between Jenny and her friends. They played as kids. When they got older, the game stuck around. The locations, the people, and the context would always change. But the game stayed the same. Truth or dare was more or less what they were known for. Going out with Jenny and her friends to play a game like that became a popular pastime in Jenny's high school. It was a rite of passage. If you wanted to be cool, you had to take a dare from Jenny. It wasn't often that Jenny herself was on the receiving end. When she was, she made it a point to not just succeed in that dare, but to surpass it. If you asked Jenny to do something dangerous, she wouldn't just risk her safety, she would risk her life. It got to the point that no one thought daring Jenny was any fun. No one except for the new kids. They didn't know any better. Neither did Jenny. The scene of this particular game was a warehouse. Once upon a time, it had been used as storage for a nearby factory. They shaped steel there. What they used it for, Jenny never really knew. But the materials were stored in that place at least back in the town's heyday. Now it was just an empty building, same as any other. And like any other empty building, it was the perfect place for Jenny and her friends to tease one another. They thought getting a little scared was a fun way to pass the time, especially when someone new was in the circle. They let that person warm up with a few light questions, a couple truths, and when it was that person's turn to challenge someone, they challenged Jenny, truth or dare, that was how Jenny wound up in the basement. But she wasn't just going to go down into the derelict sublevel. She had to do more. It wasn't enough that the stairs creaked as she descended them. And it wasn't enough that they had nearly given out near the bottom. She needed to come back from the basement with a trophy. She needed to show that she hadn't just entered it, but she had conquered it too. It was the only way to maintain her reputation. It was the only way to win the game. She pushed deeper into the basement, beyond the threshold where the light from the staircase illuminated the floor. She felt around in the dark. Even her flashlight was barely strong enough to make a difference in the darkness. When she heard something move nearby, her heart stopped. It felt swollen and bulbous. It felt like it had jumped into her throat and stopped there. It wasn't because she had heard something fall or skid or slide as she brushed up against it. Whatever was out there hidden by the black it had skittered past her. She heard the tapping of what sounded like nails on the floor. They struck the ground in rapid succession. There were too many legs. Even before she saw them, that was how she knew. And how could she not be afraid? How could she not be terrified when she suddenly realized that she had climbed down into the nest of a spider? She turned to run and there it was. She thought she could move quickly enough to escape it, 
She thought foolishly that she could expect it to be on the ground, in the distance, hiding. As she turned, she realized how untrue all of those expectations were. It wasn't hiding. It was staring her down. It wasn't in the distance. It was so close that if she reached out, she could touch it. She could brush the prickly thick hairs along its body with the palm of her hand. It wasn't on the ground either. It was on the ceiling. Jenny found herself shrinking. She hadn't felt so small since she was a child. There had never been a dare big enough to intimidate her. Yet here she was, terrified. The spider was as big as her torso. Its legs spread out as far as her own wingspan. It could have leapt onto her and wrapped its legs around her body like a straight jacket. It could have drained her of her blood and her life. She imagined all those terrible things at once. And then Jenny, with the great wisdom of a 16-year-old, remembered that she didn't need that trophy after all. She ran like her life depended on it. She heard the spider hiss as she passed underneath it. She ducked her head and ran her fingers through her hair, as if to shake free any smaller spiders that might have fallen from the main one's body. It felt like they were crawling all over her. She was still squirming and scratching at herself as she emerged at the top of the stairs. Jenny's friends were laughing. Then they realized how ghostly white she'd become. When she tried to explain, they didn't seem to believe her. They tried not to. But even in their disbelief, none of them were brave enough to go downstairs next. The right had come to its natural conclusion. After that, dares didn't seem so impressive. 